you're a big franchise with a TV show, movie, or movies. Video game, what's next? Books. Literary adaptation of X franchise is a wide descriptor and you've probably seen it. From things like picture book adaptations of kids movies, to the million bajillion Star Wars books or Halo novels, FNAF books, I mainly want to focus on spin-offs here. Because in the case of something like a Star Wars or a FNAF, they expand the world of the original, serve as forbidden texts, with extra stories featuring your favorite characters and bits of lore outside the original source material. Alright people, you know the formula, My Little Pony, not including picture books, art books, or the $200 coffee table character guidebook. My Little Pony has had around 30 original books based on the franchise. Ponies are a big seller and Little Brown and Company, the publisher, and Hasbro definitely knew how to push them into the market. Not even the Scholastic Book Fair was safe from them. But as a fan of MLP who seeks out extra stuff beyond the show, what value do they have for me? Well, really, nostalgia. For being in elementary school. Okay, after reading these, I realized that these are for kids. Like, for kids, for kids. They still do have some fun stories that I think would be worth your time as a Pony fan. Not all of them, but why don't we take a short look at all the My Little Pony books to see which ones are worth the read and which ones aren't. Now, to start out, we're gonna look at the main series. Websites like the MLP Fandom Wiki say that all the Pony books are part of a single series, since they share a publisher and usually are written by the same author, but I'd compare it more to the comics, where they're separate into different categories, with a main series, quote unquote, sort of in the middle. Of course, the timeline between the books and the comics is different, but you get what I'm trying to say. GM Barrow is the main author for the books. From reading them, I had to assume she was at least a fan of the show. Again, like the crews from the comics, but no, she actually works on the show. And I mean that in present tense. She's been writing for G5 and presumably onwards. She did start with the books, however, and then move on to the show, having writing credits on episodes like... The one where Pinkie Pie knows, and Fluttershy leans in, and the end in Friend. But you know, Granny's Gone Wild was pretty good, I'll give her that. And for what she does with the books, I will say it's good enough. These feel like an episode of MLP, not just with the way the characters and stories are, but the length of them. None of these are grand epics. If you adapted any of them to TV, you'd for sure end up with a 22 minute episode, or maybe even shorter. All these max out at about 150 pages, with very generous font sizes. Took me under an hour to get through each one, which is good because archive.org only lets you borrow these for an hour at a time. And yeah, before people accuse me of being a filthy pirate for using an online library, I did have to buy some of these physically. I tried to get as many of them as I could through an online service or ebook seller, but the later ones nobody bothered to publish online. So now Jeff Bezos has more of my money than I was willing to give him, just so that I can read Pinkie Pie and the Cupcake Calamity. It wasn't worth it. <laughs> Twilight and the Crystal Hearts Fell is the first book in the series released in early 2013. The book follows Twilight Sparkle trying to become a better princess. Cadence gives her this medallion that starts corrupting her, and she's kind of mean to her friends, and then they make up. There's other stuff that happens in this, but it was a bad first impression. It was really anticlimactic, like Twilight being corrupted by a medallion that heightens her emotions should have more of a dire third act, but she just runs out to the Crystal Empire and stares into a lake sadly. There's some stuff in Ponyville with the main six I thought was good. I thought they captured the characters really well in this. They also use a lot of other characters from the show, which was nice. Mare Mare, The Cakes, Derpy gets a mention, Trixie and Gilda show up to lead Twilight astray. Those parts made me hopeful because I got the feeling that the author actually watched the show, but other parts felt like they were aiming for a younger audience even younger than the show, of course. I mean, look at this cover, I don't know what I was expecting. The part at the very beginning where Twilight's going around Ponyville trying to ask Mare Mare how to be a leader felt a little out of place. I think Twilight would just go to another library if she couldn't find anything, not have this, oh, well, ask the grown-ups what to do thing. And again, that climax. Whenever there's magical stuff in MLP, even in these one-off stories, it usually has some greater effect, not just on the person who's being affected, or some danger to it, which justifies it being magic. Episodes I'm thinking of are the cutie pox or inspiration manifestation. The story in this just feels like a watered down version of that second one. For most of these books, I'm going to have a little segment at the end to talk about some new lore thing they introduce, since I know that's what a lot of people here are interested in. It can either be actual lore or just something weird that they canonize. This one features Cadence's backstory. As a filly, she used that same medallion to defeat an evil witch. The rest, as they say, is history. Also, Cadence used to be a pegasus instead of a unicorn. The beginning of this one made me roll my eyes too, it felt like I was reading a story from G3. Pinkie Pie finds one day on her calendar where she doesn't have a party planned, 
Oh no! So she plans a spring sproing party to ring in the new season with bouncy castles and spring shoes and yada yada yada, but that's only the first few chapters. Consider that the cold open to our actual episode. The story here is pretty nice. Pinkie Pie's folks show up and say that the rock farm is going to go out of business, so now they've got to put on a show to save the farm. And who better to do that than Pinkie Pie? But uh oh, her parents don't want crazy parties at a time like this. So now Pinkie Pie's sad and goes into serious mode. It's like that Spongebob episode where she has an office set up in a room and starts wearing glasses and a tie. Not too good for the main six because the rest of them are trying to get this party going on, but it's not the same without Pinkie. The party eventually happens, Pinkie Pie makes up with her parents, and all is well. I like this story. It felt like something that would be in just a nice normal episode. We've all seen Pinkie Pie go off the rails, but normal Pinkie Pie is fun too. I also liked the relationship with her parents. Them not being into parties, or at least not taking them seriously, is an interesting thing for them to go through with Pinkie. And with her one wanting their approval. I much prefer that to something like the episode Hearthbreakers, where her folks just don't care. I know on that episode that was the whole joke, and this is technically more cliche, but I, re I really don't care. At least there was some sort of character drama in this book that I could care about. Marvel and Limestone show up too, but like you'd imagine, they don't have their personalities down yet. They're just kind of blank-faced like Pinky's parents. This book's weird lore tidbit is that this is probably the first reference to mod in any piece of MLP material. There's a short bit where Pinkie Pie's like, Marvel? Limestone, where's the other? And then her folks are like, they ain't done writing her episode yet or something. This was published months before that episode came out. There's this thing they do I noticed, where they do wink nudge references to certain episodes. Like, there's a part in this, where Rainbow Dash is like, that would be just like the Dizitron from the episode Wonderbolts Academy. Not sure exactly how I feel about that, but it usually takes me out. In a lot of these books, there are passages where the author will be like, this is just like that time where nobody had come to Pinkie Pie's party like in that episode Party of One, huh? And maybe it's to reach a word or page limit, or probably to give more context to the character characters, but I don't know. To me, I thought it was a little distracting. Okay, my brother actually had this one when we were kids. The one thing I remember from this was Pinkie Pie's yellow balloon, and sure enough, Pinkie Pie's yellow balloon does get mentioned in the book. Good job. The newest book in Rainbow Dash's favorite, The Daring Do series, comes out. And she's excited as ever. When she and Twilight start a book club with ponies around town, the titular Double Dare is issued to Rainbow Dash, daring her to do any of the stunts from the books. Rainbow then becomes the talk of the town, doing dares for pretty much every pony, to the point where it starts messing with her head. It takes a turn when Zakora has Rainbow Dash save this artifact from the Everfree Forest, and she decides to go it alone. The other main six, after giving her a bag of stuff to use on her adventure, tag along to help Rainbow Dash in secret. There's this climax with an evil zebra, Rainbow Dash saves the main six and learns the air of her ways. I wasn't on the edge of my seat for this whole thing, but it was enjoyable. This felt like a better version of that one episode, The Mysterious Merdewell, which they do reference in here, and it's in that same way when they're like, this is just like that one time when I was a superhero. Okay, family guy. I think it works here better than the episode, because Rainbow is actually doing something wrong, she's putting herself in danger, and with the whole dare thing, pretty much derails the whole idea of the book club. You know, I think we're going up in quality with these, our first book being a bad version of an episode, and this being a good version of an episode. So, you know. A++. The parts I didn't like were the general writing quirks like the references, and they really love the term furrowed their brow. That's in every book here. They also call Applejack a yellow pony. Come on, dude. This book's tidbit has to be Braze, the evil zebra who goes out to the Everfree Forest to get the artifact. He also speaks in rhyme like Sakura, so either this is non-canon to the comics and all zebras rhyme, or he also speaks in rhyme to make his magic stronger, which is what I think Sakura did in the comics. A new pony named Charity moves to Ponyville as Rarity's apprentice. She slowly starts imitating Rarity in everything she does, from her hair, to her voice, to her taste in sweets, everything. There's even a part where she delivers some outfits and people mistake her for Rarity. She just goes with it. Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't really do this kind of story in an episode. Not with Rarity, but just any character in general. Closest thing I can think of is Simple Ways, but that's a whole different way of going about it. To solve this problem and get back at her, Rarity just makes herself look like Charity, and not not even in two paragraphs. Charity is like, oh no, what am I doing? But it's like I said, a fun little story. Complaints I have are copy paste from the rest, but I think this one is sweet enough to make up for it. And while they did have the remember the time moments, I just really didn't care. Miss Barrow has made me numb to it by this point. One new thing I'm gonna bring up is how they love pony puns for names. Like they reference Maris Prance in this one, and in the Pinkie Pie one they have the band Cold Hay perform. These are full of stuff like that. This book's weird tidbit is that Spike is shallow. <laughs> Charity dies her main purple and he immediately falls for it 
but like that's a different lady dude that's not rarity or maybe he has a type don't know and i don't want to know aj is in the finals for this best farm and equestria contest and she has to make sure her farm is up to snuff so she can win in the early chapters there are a lot of references to ledgers and counting the exact number of apples yielded by each tree so i thought the switcheroo was going to be with the numbers like aj wins when someone else deserved to and she has to be honest because you know that's what she does but no for most of the middle this is a main six do x thing but each pony has their own way of doing things story my favorite! AJ has this diary she keeps enduring the oh so hilarious hijinks with the main six at Sweet Apple Acres. She vents about each of them and how frustrating it is trying to work with them. At the end of it, Apple Bloom gives that to the main six instead of the friendship journal that they were keeping together. So now all the ponies see what she's been saying about them. AJ thinks it's over for their friendship, but they forgive her and understand that her private thoughts don't mean they aren't friends. I like the references they do to past books. Here they reference Charity's new fashion show, and even in the last one they reference the party for Pinkie Pie's mom that they were gonna throw after the Rockin' Pony Palooza one. This one also has a reference to Minty, so immediate 10 out of 10. The confrontation between AJ and the main six takes like two seconds at the end though. I don't know what it is with these and having a really quick wrap up. There's usually like a good one or two chapters where everything is all happy go lucky after the climax, so why not push it a little into there? Okay, so the comics are canon to the books. Not only in an earlier one do they reference Pinkie Pie's giant mascot suit of herself, but here the main event takes place in Winnieland, which was in the comic. Fluttershy takes Angel Bunny to this bunny circus, and after seeing it, Angel tries to have his own special talent. It turns into Fluttershy trying to teach Angel how to herd like a sheepdog. Later, they go to this titular fair at Winnieland, and Angel wins second place in the herding competition, which was pretty good considering how Flutters was doubting being able to for the whole book. Most of it centers on them not being able to do the herding during practice and Fluttershy just wanting to get it done for Angel's self-esteem, knowing he'll probably lose the competition. This book is one of the better ones. It's great seeing more pony stories in this format. I mean, they are written like episodes, so it's like having a lost episode script in your hands you can read and imagine all the little scenes. This book's weird little detail is that Rainbow Dash and Lightning Dust were apparently on good terms in between Wonderbolt's Academy and the washouts because here they are in this going to Winnieland together on a date, perhaps? Now, these main six books, I get the feeling that they might have come up with the titles first. Especially this one, it's such a stereotypical Fluttershy thing. Fine furry friends fair that sounds like a playset. They're kind of vague in that way where it could really be about anything, but that's probably for marketing. Okay, so we've covered the main six books, which were all released within a short amount of time, and for whatever reason, I always associated these later books with the later episodes, but this one with Discord came out a number of months after the last, so not really to the point where you can make a big division between the main six books and the rest of these. Anyways, I was excited to sit down and read this one. A story like this featuring Discord could be a lot of fun, and I really don't know what to expect, since there's always, obviously, something wacky going down with them. This one has Discord moving to Ponyville, after Celestia makes him participate in that year's Ponyville Spring Musical. Yeah, a weird mission, but she promises Discord that she'll give him back something important that he lost a long time ago. There's this bit at the beginning where Discord uses his magic to swindle this real estate agent into giving him the house for free, and then you have that guy show up throughout the rest of the story in, in little cameo bits like, oh, I wonder if he's gonna come back in some way. I'm too old to be reading these. Discord auditions for the play, gets into the ensemble, and hijinks ensue. He messes with ponies for a bit during the rehearsals, and then some pony starts actually sabotaging the production. Because of this, Discord gets kicked out, and they think it's him, and he comes back disguised as a pony, where we get this book's lore tidbit. His cutie mark is canonically a tornado in his pony form. They figure out it's the real estate guy, confrontation happens over one page, and all is well. Besides the tornado thing, this book is full of some other little lore bits. Tons of pony versions of real musicals like the singing stallion music man which you kind of had an obvious way of doing with the music mare but whatever they also reference hinny of the hills which was in the episode rarity takes manhattan if you'll remember i like discord a lot in this he's like a guy in a minecraft survival server who has creative mode enabled and just doesn't care he can do whatever the musical setting is also a fun idea at the end it turns out that the thing celestia was holding on to was discord's pet clownfish named q like the guy from star trek who's played by discord 
Discord's voice actor. I also need to touch on the iconic character Senior Mint, this green Pegasus stallion who's referenced in way too many of these. He's in the musical here and in the choir that Rarity makes dresses for in her book, and has little mentions and minor roles in so many others. Like, he's not a character from the show. Looking up Senior Mint gives you nothing on Google. Does he know something that we don't? While a book with Discord as the main character might have been weird, this one is beyond bizarre, because this is obviously just for bronies, when all of these others are mostly for the kid audience. Bon Bon is part of a secret monster fighting agency, or was, since she'd assumed they'd disbanded a long time ago. Turns out that the chief needs her help again, and she has to drop everything to go on a mission. They have these men in black mind eraser devices, and the chief is going to use one on Lyra, but since she doesn't want to forget her friend, Lyra agrees to become a spy as well. It's such a weird story. It feels like something that would be a fan fiction, but for what it is, I thought it was pretty enjoyable. They go out to Appaloosa to find a secret changeling infestation, and it's a little mystery spy story. No lore tidbit because there would be too much. Seeing this actual agency that they reference in a single episode is enough, but they have these lines about how the Breezies, T-Rex, and Nightmare Moon were all cover-ups or something, question mark. I assume the changeling in disguise here would be someone in the agency, but it's just this one old mare who every pony in town has a crush on. You know, makes sense. At the end, the main six come in and capture the changeling. It's not part of any Queen Chrysalis scheme, but you know, if you've played any of the Flash games or read the comics, you'll understand that in these supplemental pieces of MLP media, they love using changelings for random stuff in a bold new direction for these books. Starlight doesn't furrow her brow here. She raises her brow. Okay, for real. Starlight is practicing spells with Twilight when she wants some alone time and finds a secret room in the castle to work on the spell in peace. But because the spell wasn't finished in the first place, it makes time act all wonky, speeding up and slowing down when she's in there, and it ends with this big vortex sucking everything into Twilight's castle. From the start, Starlight's all on her, oh, I used to be evil stuff, so I just, I just checked out. There's a lore bit, uh, senior Mint shows up. Trixie wants to get into the Grand Magician Society in Equestria and needs to come up with some new magic trick to impress them. While going around town, Rarity accidentally zaps her with a shiny spell meant for one of her dresses. Trixie gets the Midas touch, but she touched it too much, and now she's in danger of turning into an inanimate crystal statue. She doesn't listen to her friends when they try to stop her, of course, since the crystal powers are a perfect magic trick. The Magician's Banquet happens, and Trixie almost gets transformed until Starlight saves her at the very last second. I've been dogging on these resolutions for these, but the line Trixie has in this one is so weak. She's like, I thought that if they saw my glow hoof, uh, they might think I was special. Like she was about to have her life ended by this, that's all you've got to say. I am too old to be reading these. The lore tidbit for this book is that there's now a gold rush in Ponyville from Trixie's magic hook. There are even prospectors panning for gold outside the Everfree Forest. And that's the main series. The stories were pretty short and sweet, and I think elementary school kids who like MLP would really enjoy these. Outside of things to add on to the MLP wiki, I'm not sure there's too much you can get out of these as an older fan. Besides, of course, nostalgia. Gotta have that nostalgia. Listen dude, I can handle nostalgia. I can quit nostalgia whenever I want. Not just if you read the as a kid, I didn't. And these did in a way bring me back to that time, when I was in elementary school. I mean, nothing beats the strange case of Origami Yoda, but I'm pretty sure these would have been fun to younger me. None of them are badly written, outside from maybe that Twilight one. Yeah, cr Crystal Heart Smell, more like Twilight and the Crystal Heart Smell. Good MLP stories, but I'll stick with the show or the comics. But we're only 9 out of 30 here, what other pony stuff did they pull from? Equestria Girls, of course. Being a series of movies and specials, there are a ton of direct adaptations. Those have some minor differences like scenes slash lines of dialogue cut or added. Nothing that changes it dramatically to the point where I feel the need to read them. I'd rather get into the originals, which were written by Perdita Finn and later Arden Hayes, different authors. Already I'm not looking forward to these, since I doubt they'd really do anything interesting with Equestria Girls. But before we do, the only adaptation that's worth talking about separately is Make Your Own Magic, which is based on one of the later specials. This adapts the special with the Choose Your Own Adventure format. For those who don't know, Choose Your Own Adventure books have been around since the 80s. While there is an official Choose Your Own Adventure trademark brand, you find a lot of these from all around the literary world. Readers are on an adventure with the main character, and every so often, they're given a choice. Flip to this page for X, flip to that page for Y. There are usually several different endings, and many involve you failing your adventure. Or failing being alive. But this is Equestria Girl, so obviously it's 
it's a little more tame. You have the same ending from the movie you can get, but you can also get a lot of the bad ones. Most of them having Sunset Shimmer trapped in a time loop, which is the premise of the movie. Anyways, what about those original stories? All of these were written by a different author from the main series, so let's see. Is there a drop in enjoyment, or are they better? Is it even noticeable? The Equestria Girls books are all based around slice of life stories. No real magic stuff to be found here. The first one released, Sunset Shimmer's Time to Shine, came out in 2015, and is meant to be a bridge between the second and third Equestria Girls movie. Sunset struggles to be a better friend, and to understand the Equestria Girls' trademarked magic transformations. There was a short from, I think, Friendship Games that had that same premise, but this plotline is throughout the whole thing. Sunset hangs out with the main six, and tries to study them with all this science stuff, and it ends up messing with all their activities. When Oh no, the big fundraiser is coming up! It's one of those things where each of them has their own thing to do, Fluttershy with their animals, Rarity with the, the, the fashion, we've seen it a million times before. I like that they have a little more focus on the other people in the school not liking Sunset, and this story is another step in her character arc, or whatever. The whole thing with the magic studying was a snore, yeah I'll stick to the movies if I want to hear about stuff like that. It reminds me of G5 honestly, where they have like three plot points that they just repeat for the whole thing. We, we gotta find the magic you guys! We find Finally have magic! Magic, magic, magic! Oh no, she's gonna steal the magic! Twilight's sparkly sleepover surprise is another story that bridges two movies. This time, it's the third and fourth. Sai Twi, aka the Equestria Girls World version of Twilight, is hanging out with the other main six, and she too needs to learn how to be a good friend. Between all the friend stuff they do, the girls from Crystal Prep show up and try to steer Twilight down the wrong path. Turns out that they don't know how to be friends. The Crystalites show up to one of the main six's sleepovers and ruin everything, and Twilight is given this crown by the main six as a reward for behaving herself, while the others have to sleep outside or something, I don't know. The crown, of course, is said sparkly sleepover surprise. Also, only a few of the crystal prep kids show up here, it's only three. You know, where's the classic character Indigo's app, or one with the headphones? Yeah, while I did enjoy my time with the main series, these Equestria Girls books aren't too interesting. I guess if I was more a fan of these characters, I'd want to, but I don't care about the daily goings on of these human versions. Yeah, I want to see ponies. And there are a few more EG books to cover before we move on. Canterlot Stories was written by a different author from the other two here. These are a trilogy of books, each focused around a different character. These are some of the first ones I had to get the physical editions of, because they came out so late in MLP's lifespan, like 2018 we're talking. They all use this specific art on their covers that I only remember seeing on a few dolls and nothing else. I think it looks really neat with this hand-drawn style and the scrapbook design for the graphic stuff, but by 2018 that was already outdated. What isn't though is that calligraphy font for the title, oh boy this makes me want to live, laugh, and love. While most of the books we've looked at have had little activity pages in the back, this one promises fashion tips for the young readers, including encouraging them to make a shopping list for Rainbow Dash's signature style. Yeah, Common Sense Media gives this one five green orbs for consumerism. Anyways, let's look at the first one of these. Rainbow Dash brings the Blitz. A sport called Blitzball is sweeping the human world. Rainbow Dash is a big fan and gets even more excited about the sport when she finds out that their town is going to have their own high school Blitzball league. Big problem, the league is only for men, so Rainbow and friends have to prove the coach wrong and show that girls can get it done. I don't know, I talked about it in another video about how in this franchise, I don't think you'd have to have a story where you prove how capable the female characters are, but this is a real world and things are obviously different than a fantasy pony dimension. This kind of thing does happen. and. It's a message that's good for kids to stick up to it. Rainbow Dash stands up for herself, and the coach, after being mean for the whole book, turns around and lets the team be unisex. There's also a thing about trying to win versus having fun because this is for kids, and yeah, you gotta show how good the main six are as friends versus the boys team who get worked to the bone by the coach character, and you know, they don't want to be on that team no more. In order to better student relations, Canterlot High and Crystal Prep agree to hold a joint science fair, where students from both schools are teamed up to work on a project. Twilight gets teamed up with this dreamboat new character named Rising Star. Characters become suspicious of his intentions with their project and think he's planning to sabotage Canterlot High with it in some way. In the end, it's all a misunderstanding and he just wanted to change it to make the Crystal Prep kids nicer to each other. With brainwashing, oh no, this one's trash, there's not anything good about it, at least all the others you could say were 
written okay. Like some of the vocab or the prose in the main six series was a little advanced for an elementary school reader, but this is written so plainly. It's like an extended picture book. Me when the children's book I'm reading is for children. The one thing I think did anything for me was the twist with this rising star character. The way they describe him did have me flip-flopping on whether they were going to make him evil or not. In the beginning, they go a little too hard on how dreamy he is with his big green eyes, all that. Let me read you how they introduce him. He had huge green eyes and was wearing his uniform shirt untucked, which was against the dress code. He strode up to her and smiled the cutest dimple-filled smile. <laughs> Last but not least, huh? He said, I'm Rising Star. And all the stuff about him in those first chapters is like that. So you know there's more to him. Plus, he's from the evil school, so yeah, he's evil. Misdirection. But Mr. Flash Sentry gets jealous of Twilight for hanging out with another guy, so he stalks Rising Star and finds secret plans to use their joint signs for a project for subliminal messaging. Why is Flash Sentry stalking this random guy out of jealousy? And he gets to be the main love interest? What a sick joke. Actually, it might make sense, because if you remember in that first Sequestria Girls movie, there's a part where he somehow happened to fish pictures of Twilight out of the trash. You know, I think he's got some tendencies, that's all I'll say. I did kind of like the conflict of Twilight having to confront her past at the evil crystal school, and in the end having to redeem the guy after he admits to changing her project without asking. There's all that stuff that MLP loves to do, where X character is all nice, but they're like, oh, they know I was evil, they're all secretly judging me because I was evil. And they bring that around when she finds out the thing, and Rising Star is like, oh, they're gonna judge me! Well, they're gonna judge me too, buddy. Also, can I say, even though it's not evil like they thought, the idea of their science fair project is terrifying. I don't care how fun making people subconsciously want to bust a move is, they still call it hypnosis and or brainwashing. Not a fun thing to think about. And these are teenagers using it. Yeah, call Dan Aykroyd because that's nothing but trouble. I like that during the end, Flash is like, yeah, well I was right because the other guy was still acting up and nobody cares. We also see the iconic character Abacus Finch. Listen, I know she's awful, but I do agree when she gets freaked out at being hypnotized. Heartbreaking, the worst person you know just made a good point. Even the activity pages in this one are useless because I didn't remember if I bought this new or used and they were already colored in. Welcome to the Cantor Chris Science Fair, it says on the back. Yeah, you know they gotta give the Science Fair a catchy name. Everyone is having a gay old time at Sugar Cube Corner, the number one hangout spot for Canterlot High Kids, when a rival chain bakery opens across the street. Pinkie Pie and friends must find a way to drum up business. It ends up being about Pinkie Pie and Rarity throwing this party, and Rarity taking the whole thing over. You'd think it would be one of those stories where they learn to meet in the middle, but no, they just let Rarity throw the party. She knows better! In the middle of the book, there's hijinks with them trying different events, and those backfiring, and that's all nothing burger. There is a part where they make a joke about this old guy who always comes in, and how he wouldn't be able to spread it through word of mouth since he's old and all his friends have passed on. Wow, Sunset, I thought you changed. These are clearly for younger kids, even younger than the others. Either that or they're just bad. But with that, that's all the Equestria Girls books. My thoughts on these don't reflect my thoughts on the movies. I think those first three are fine, and some things in these books were amusing, but I thought that these really weren't worth my time. Reminds me of why I never watched the rest of Equestria Girls. That and I don't want to get put on a list. But clearly people don't share my opinion, because a Equestria Girls was so popular, it got its own spin-off books. Let's look at those before we move on. Canterlot High Tell All is kind of a guidebook type thing for EG, just like there are a whole bunch of official guidebooks for FIM. It's structured as this diary burn book, reverse burn book, because this it's only good things that the main six have to say about their school. The one interesting part is the part where they all list their crushes, but besides that, it was a skim for me. I do think this is a nice way of presenting this type of book though. Wonder Colts Forever has another analog with the regular pony book, but we're not gonna get into that just yet. Wonder Colts Forever is a diary from Principal Celestia and Luna. It gives a backstory to the friendship games and some other stuff, but I'm sorry, I just don't find it too interesting. I also don't like how the young versions of them are just the same models with the same clothing but short and without the slight little wrinkles on their faces. Well, how about we go from the real world back to the pony world with a real version of a pony book? That's right, Daring Do. Daring Do is an in-universe series of adventure books that the ponies read, mainly Rainbow Dash. Relatively early on in the series, it's revealed that all the books are written 
written by and based on the exploits of a real adventure hero in the MLP world. All the things that she writes about are supposed to be secret, though. Yeah, that makes no sense, but Daring Do! Three Daring Do books were released in 2014 simultaneously in the Daring Do Adventure Collection, which came in a fancy case with some other little goodies. They were later published separately in 2016. Let's take a look at these to see if they're worth getting sucked into the world of Daring Do the same way the Rainbow Dash did. Of course, none of them are based on the books that appear in the show, like Daring Do and the Sapphire Statue, but after reading these, I see why. Whatever they had going on in the show was way more interesting than these. Daring Do and the Marked Thief of Maripor is the first in this specific series. It has Daring Do travel to this village to search for three magical artifacts. When she arrives, it turns out that she's part of a prophecy involving a yellow pegasus, and the titular Marked Thief wants her to complete a ritual, which will restore his scarred cutie mark. I like the references to the show, yeah of course I do. Obviously stuff that's been in other Daring Do adventures, as well as the comics too. There's a part where she uses Goops for stuff brand cream, which was something from one of the early, early comics. There are also some really painful puns here, like Yucatan Poninsula, or when Daring Do has to disguise herself, she says her name is Marion Ravenwood. Ha. Huh. Like, I don't know, I just didn't find anything to care about in this one. I know this village is gonna get destroyed by a volcano, but it just felt so bland. Daring Do doesn't have anything special about her. It was boring. Just boring. And I think that's because, here's me cracking the code, the Daring Do stories in that initial episode were meant to just be a generic action-adventure story. Like, we all understand it. It's Indiana Jones. You see her solving puzzles in some temple and running through the jungle, and you hear Rainbow Dash say all these long, complicated names of artifacts and you get it. We don't need any more elaboration because we know what Rainbow is experiencing through reading it and it's just there to be a part of that story in that episode. But then you go and you make those generic adventure stories into parts of actual episodes and real books and yeah, there's nothing to hook me in because there's nothing about it that's meant to. I don't care about Daring Do. Anyways, there's two more of these. Daring Do and the Eternal Flower had to be my favorite out of these three, just because there were things that were unique and things I could sort of connect to. Daring Do goes with her uncle to find a flower that grants immortality. They go out to the Dragonlands, which is cool, that's what they should do for these, do things that are exclusive to MLP lore. I know the last book had something to do with cutie marks, but nothing was especially used for a set piece or any big part of the story like it is here. There was also more character stuff I liked, like the uncle and the other Pegasus lady who betrays them in the end. Fun fact, that character, Rosie Thorne, was going to be in an episode, but it was scrapped during the writing stage. This one felt a little more unique, and not like something that you'd reference in passing in some episode. Okay, they're back to being boring. Daring Do wants to find some artifact in this hidden city and meets up with this old adventurer who went there once. She tries to get into this city, and there's this plot about the Duchess and the old adventure guy being ex-lovers. Daring Do joins this elite society of adventurers, and then it ends and I woke up from my bad dream where I had to read these. And there are probably better kids action adventure stories like these in book form, and for sure there are better MLP stories. These books are obviously for kids, I guess, and they're not gonna make the lore too complicated, like I'm guessing it actually is in the universe of the show. I'm not sure though, since most of these had glossaries at the end explaining what everything was. You know what, these are for nobody. They're things that bronies put on their shelves as replica props. That's why they were first released as a collector's item. There's nothing fun that I can imagine kids getting attached to, and in these kinds of stories, adults are gonna want something more intense or with more depth, which you can't do because this is My Little Pony. Okay, think of Daring Do as the valley. We just got out of there and we're reaching another peak. Not there yet, but we're getting there. The Princess Collection was a series of books, again, which were released simultaneously. Each of them focuses on one of the main four princesses, telling a story loosely tied to one of the four seasons. And I mean loosely, some of them it's barely even the setting. Celestia and the Summer of Royal Waves. If we don't get a description of Celestia on a surfboard, I don't want it. Anyway, the book is about Princess Celestia traveling to the seaside kingdom to teach the kids in the royal magic school there. The teacher is all strict, and when she goes away for a while, Celestia teaches the kids how to have fun, and it makes their magic stronger. I liked seeing this fun side to Celestia that isn't downright silly like in the comics. The seaside setting is a fun idea, and the moral about making learning fun is always appreciated. There's something about a prophecy of monsters attacking the city, and the teacher character misunderstanding what's gonna happen when this hourglass goes out, but the hourglass is just meant to look like it's always gonna go out. You could have told her that from the start, Celestia. 
The ponies of Ponyville want to throw Luna a festival in the winter, kinda like what they have for Celestia in the summer. Luna is a recluse, so she's against it, and messes with every pony's dreams, so they're influenced to make the festival a bunch of random nonsense. I think a monster attacks Ponyville at the end, I don't know. I like this one too, it was just a good old Luna story. There's also some bits of lore here, Luna is also a guardian of animals in Equestria, on top of being princess of the night. And we get an explanation for those two bat ponies, who always show up next to her. Apparently there's an actual of bat ponies who live outside of Equestria. Luna saved these two from a dragon while she was trying to solve a conflict between the two races, and now they've indebted themselves to her. They also reference Tiberius, the pet possum that she has in the comics. Thank goodness the Cadence story is the shortest one out of all of these. Joking, but there's nothing too interesting with her that they've done ever. Like, she's nice, she's a mom. Anyways, she wants to fix up this royal garden and has all these school kids help out, but one obviously is not okay with being free labor, so she steals some magical seeds from her grandpa and plants them in the garden. Hijinks ensue before they set everything right, and Cadence forgives her. But yeah, it's a pretty short story. There's the detail I forgot to mention way back in the first book that Cadence has memorized the names of everyone in the Crystal Empire. She's nice. Twilight's second book, if you don't count the signs for one from Equestria Girls. Twilight tries to fix a damaged book with magic, but in trying, unleashes a spell that steals words from all the books in Equestria. I'd compare it to the comic story where there's the bookworm. Instead, in this one, they aren't going into books. No, Twilight goes to Booktown. Okay, it's not called Booktown, it's called Bales, and all the buildings are made out of books, and there's only libraries and bookstores. Twilight is obviously excited upon getting there. The, the book literally says, eyes glittering at the mention of such a Mecca. Religious references in my pony book? I, I know, I know, it's a metonymy. It's meant to be like Twilight views this as a holy site in a way. Weird word choice though, like not unlike the Rainbow Dash one, where they have the line Rainbow Dash swoop down like a kamikaze pilot. Wow, okay, Zero. Twilight eventually finds the spell in time for the autumnal equine Nox. Listen, at least this is better than the first one. Okay, now we're at the peak. If you're wondering why we never got any books centered on the Cutie Mark Crusaders just yet, then wonder no more because here's their representation. Ponyville Mysteries was a series of books written by Penumbra Quill, obviously a pen name. It follows the CMC joined by some new characters as they solve magical monster-related mysteries around Ponyville. Now quote-unquote mystery novels have been a staple in children's literature, going as far back as the genre does and spanning a ton of different series. You know the names, you've seen them, probably at school, either in the book bins in your classroom or when they played the Nancy Drew movie in 6th grade and Hi Hi Puffy Yami is playing on a TV in the background when all the kids in your class say it's the Powerpuff Girls when it's not, it's not. Also guys, the Prince of Egypt isn't a Disney movie. Anyways, the series starts with Schoolhouse of Secrets. Here we're introduced to Lily Moon, whose family moved to Ponyville from Trotsylvania. Her family is involved in some pretty creepy stuff, and because of their, as well as Lily Moon's appearance, she gets blamed for the recent creepy goings on. At the start of the book, there's an incident where all the school ponies arrive at the schoolhouse, and books are tossed everywhere and stuff is on the ceiling, and someone picks up and throws Pipsqueak around, it's crazy. Bad for Lily Moon, but great news for Apple Bloom, since she's been itching to do something exciting, because she and the CMC's older sisters always get to go on the cool adventures, and they gotta stay back. With that, we get some character drama between Apple Bloom and AJ. And I was itching for something like that in these. This was a great first impression. It felt fresh to me, I don't know. I don't automatically think that things are better if they're quote unquote relatable, but having a CMC story going around Ponyville after all these festivals and magic shenanigans or whatever, it's cool. There's character stuff, and as we're gonna see, an actual overarching story. I actually felt satisfied after reading it, and I wanted to read the next one. The CMC try and solve the mystery and think Lily Moon is behind it, but she's innocent. And it was actually this invisible monster. Lily Moon's weird behavior throughout the book is her trying to tame it or steer it away from Ponyville. They solve the schoolhouse mystery, but there's still more to discover. At the end of the book, a mysterious pony looks out the window of Lily Moon's house, claiming that there had to be something done about those cutie mark crusaders. The Crusaders and Lily Moon are starting to become friends, even though Lily herself is an outcast to the rest of the ponies. Lately in Ponyville, there's been a few Timberwolf attacks going on, so the CMC team up with Lily again to see what's up. They go to Zakora and figure out that this is probably a pony who's turning into a were Timberwolf. They set it up in a way where you think it's gonna be Pinkie Pie, since she wasn't there for the first incident, nor the second, and the Timberwolf only eats candy. Mm, suspicious. But no, it's actually Twist who is the werewolf. Yeah, get it? It's the character Twist. 
list. You know, this cover is really clickbait. Not only does it make you think Pinkie Pie will have a larger role in the story, there's just not a scene like this in the book. Pretty much none of these match what goes on. Now, I can't remember anything in the first one where AJ and the Crusaders were in the schoolhouse. Sweetie Belle has an arc in this about overcoming her fears, and I thought that was neat. You know, you gotta have a little something in there to keep people interested, and this kept me interested for sure. Not that the other books didn't have any character stuff, but I like when it's tied to a mystery here. And you have the Crusaders' individual problems, as well as stuff going on with the main six. It's also something new, which I like. Where we also are introduced to Lily Moon's sister, Amber Moon. She wasn't the first one, but this one has more of a focus on her, because it was a candy cane that Lily Moon stole from her that accidentally turned Twist into the werewolf. With magic like that in their house, I wonder what's gonna happen with that family. This book ends with another ominous epilogue about someone in Lily Moon's family looking for this thing called the Live Wood in the Everfree Forest. Okay, so this was released in, in what, 2017? This is the cutoff for when these are getting harder and harder to find online. This one has Scootaloo feeling left out, since Applebloom is spending so much time with Lily Moon. You have this, as well as this plot that's kind of a sequel to Sleepless in Ponyville, Scoot touches this plant that can make her hallucinate, and it also affects everyone she touches. So now the olden pony, the classic character, is running amok in Equestria. If enough people believe in her, or see her, she'll eventually become real. So the CMC and our other heroes have to find a way to stop her. I like the part with Rainbow Dash not believing in the thing and getting mad at Scootaloo. Increasingly, we're going to see the main six stepping all over the story here, trying to see what's up with Lily Moon's family, and reprimanding the CMC for getting into all these crazy magic adventures. In the end, they just defeat the Olden Pony by being nice to her, which if that ain't MLP, I don't know what is. Now from here on, I have to talk about the wider mystery in the series, so if you don't want spoilers, skip to this timestamp. Now isn't that refreshing, something I can actually give a spoiler warning for, and gotta put one in Applejack and the Honest to Goodness switcheroo. It's revealed that Lily Moon's dad was behind everything. Or is he? He's trying to break into the live wood since it holds some kind of incredible power. We also get the backstory of it in this book, so it's not really a Ponyville mystery anymore. Back before Princess Luna was Nightmare Moon, when she'd go into people's dreams, the negative emotions of the dreams would kind of corrupt her, and this happened, it kept happening slowly, to the point where she had this thing called the Helm of Shadows, which is the helmet that you see Nightmare Moon wear. After Luna was freed from Nightmare Moon, the Helm of Shadows was buried somewhere in the ever free forest, with a section of the forest being enchanted to protect it. That being the live wood. The helm being there is also supposed to be responsible for Timberwolves existing, even though according to Granny Smith in the show, Timberwolves existed way further back in equestrian history. You know, either A, I misread the book, or B, Granny Smith is off a rocker, and I don't like either of those. Or C, they just forgot that one episode when they wrote this. One of the gates of the live wood requires three ponies with matching cutie marks, and the Lily Moon family has seemingly been breeding ponies for that exact purpose, but the CMC come along with their matching cutie marks and throw a wrench into that whole thing. Luna tells the CMC this, but they're still in trouble from the main six, even though they have a magical prophecy to fulfill or something. It's framed like they have to help stop Lily Moon's dad, but the main six won't listen, when Princess Luna easily could have just told Twilight, but whatever. Also, the CMC are now technically technically part of an ancient prophecy or equestrian lore, the same way the main six are. It's weird considering that was always the big separation between the two. The main six went on the big adventures and the CMC did whatever else. Anyways, I'm excited to see how this resolves in our next two books. I just have to wait for Amazon to deliver them. Also it's called Perryton Panic because that's the name of a monster that's guarding the thing. After a confrontation with the Moon family, the CMC are cursed with bad luck. By this point, it's revealed that the family's matriarch, Auntie Eclipse, is behind this whole thing. And there's even some messed up backstory with her and the family. She's not even their aunt. Lily Moon's mom made a pact with Eclipse so that the dad would be cured of his illness, but it's sort of a Rumpelstiltskin thing, so in return she wants the babies that they have together. Eclipse then magically made all the kids' cutie marks match with the dad and put him under a hypnotic spell. So if you'll recall, she's gonna use the magic cutie marks to get into the live wood, steal the Helm of Shadows, and take over the world or something. There were a couple of fun concepts in here. Starlight Glimmer shows up and has a spell that can protect them from the bad luck curse, but they need to be standing within a certain radius of her. And by bad luck, I mean bad luck, like fatal accident bad luck. There's a cool set piece when they're trapped under a table in this library, and they're under this huge pile of books so big it could crush them, and Starlight has to let go of the protection spell, so it looks like the bad luck's gonna come back and they're gonna get crushed, but, but you know, they get out of it at the last second. Literally 
really, where was that and daring do? This and the final book in the series scratched that Indiana Jones fun adventure itch better than anything in those. Right after the thing with the library, they go to Discord's dimension, yeah, he's in this, and the bad luck curse has no effect there, since it relies on logic to work and Discord isn't logical. You know, it's so cool. This is cerebral <laughs> compared to some of these other books. Anyways, it's the 11th hour. Lily Moon and Amber Moon are under a hypnosis spell by Eclipse, and the Crusaders have to stop her, this time with the endorsement of the main six, and the newly unhypnotized dad. Okay, so now the Crusaders are full on the heroes of this story. There's a scene that echoes the first scene in the first book, where Apple Bloom is like, well, I guess we're the heroes now. I think it's cool that the CMC get to have their own story, and they acknowledge how crazy it is within the world of the show. With that, I don't understand why there hasn't been any communication between the main six and Princess Luna in this. Like, why didn't Luna tell the main six that it's the CMC who need to save the day? Or why didn't Twilight or the main six ask Luna why she made the choice to appoint them protectors of the thing? Why is she in the first place even? I assume it's because she's seen how brave the Crusaders are, and maybe she sees the fact that they need to prove themselves to their older sisters. Oh, kind of like her. Okay, never mind. I won't complain about that. that. That's fine. But again, there's always that complaint that people have about MLP in general. Like, why doesn't Princess Celestia or Discord come in and solve this big magic problem? But here it's with the main six. Uh, uh, set pieces are cool in this too. They travel down into this temple and there's all these little puzzles and rooms that the CMC get separated into. There are these markings everywhere in the cave that help them stop Eclipse in the end, and it's revealed that they just use this time travel thing from the beginning of the book to go back and add all those so they know what to do in the past. Yeah, in the story, Scootaloo thinks it's stupid, and it is, but I thought it was fun. You guys, the cutie mark Crusaders go on their own magical adventure, and they use Bill and Ted logic to beat the bad guy. What more could you want? It ends with them having saved the day, and going to school again like the first one. The kids at school are raving about the heroic thing that the main six did last week, but the CMC are satisfied with their victory. Ponyville Mysteries rules. If you want any actual recommendation as a Pony fan, then these are where it's at. They skew a little older than a lot of the others, and that makes them a little more enjoyable to read. Yeah, this ain't no baby book. This is Ponyville Mysteries. There's an actual overarching story with stakes and new characters, old ones to get invested in, and the characters are handled with some weight, and this is by far the largest scale original story from the books. In fact, it's way better than what I was expecting. I saw the covers and was anticipating just episodic mysteries with the CMC solving some nothing burger Nancy Drew caper around Ponyville. Well, it turns out that that's what the tie-in comic for the series is, and I will not be reading that. Speaking of tie-ins, I couldn't not bring up the movie. This came with a whole wave of advertising and products released alongside it. Wait, and books too? No way, I don't believe you. We've already mentioned movie novelizations with Equestria Girls. There is a novelization of the 2017 movie, but the differences don't make too much of a difference. There is one scene where Spike and Grubber, the classic character, interact near the end, and it turns out they get along well. And Grubber gets a redemption arc. That's sweet. And there are other times to the movie, though, which most take place after the film's events, but there is one that serves as a prequel to the film. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Isn't there already a prequel comic that sets up the events of the movie? Yes. And just like that comic, this book is kind of meh. Both the prequel comic and prequel book do that thing where every single little bit of story is set up before the thing it's a prequel to. In the comic, the bird pirates are drafted into the Storm King's army, Capper goes on the run, all that really quickly when you'd assume things like that would be gradual or happen off screen at very different points in time. The comic and the book, from what I've seen, have a similar origin story for Tempest. She finds some magic thing that the Storm King wants, <laughs> and then she points him to Equestria. But there's a part in the book where Tempest is there when the hippogriffs get raided and have to go underwater, and that happens like a month before the movie, or a few months, I don't know. It all feels so weird to have these events so close to each other or connected. You don't get that impression watching the movie. One bit I did think was neat was how the names of Tempest's friends are the same in here and in the comic. After looking into all this lore, MLP really is a multimedia franchise. There are a lot of parallels between everything. Anyways, let's look at those other movie books, aka Beyond Equestria, as they're subtitled. With Pinkie Pie Steps Up, we're back to GM Barrow. I know that isn't too shocking, but I'm writing this just after reading those Equestria Girls Canterlot High books, so yeah. Pinkie Pie and Cheese Sandwich throw a party for all these Equestrian celebrities. Songbird Serenade, 
the Sia Pony, sees Pinkie Pie's dance moves and hires her to dance for her when she performs at the Equestrian Music Awards. It turns into a plot where the rehearsals keep getting sabotaged and Lyra and Bon Bon show up, which was surprising to see again. I wasn't expecting much from this book, but it was enjoyable. This has such a nice flow to it. Probably bare minimum, but I appreciated the way it was written. I also like the references, I'm not gonna lie. With the setting of the Equestrian Grammys, we get some cameos from Sapphire Shores, Photo Finish, Feather Bangs of all characters, and Countess Calrachura. She, or her episode plays a pretty big part in the story. Pinkie Pie and Sia find out that it's Sia's assistant that's been messing everything up. At the beginning, there's a bit with her talking about how demanding Countess Calrachura is. Hmm. At the end, it's revealed that the whole plot was so that Calrachura would look bad, and that the assistant was doing it for her brother, the manager from that episode. What an obscure character to have this whole thing be based around. You know, they sold this book based on the movie, but if anything, you need to watch that one episode to get the context. Anyways, we don't get too much info about Songbird Serenade as a character here. I guess it is nice to have more time with her, but there's not much to her. She's just nice pop star who believes in Pinkie Pie when others think she's too silly. I don't know, it feels like a character we've already seen by now. Not in the books, but probably in the show. Also, there's a line that made me crack up, not because it's clever or anything, but because it's like a Simpsons joke. Sia sees Pinkie Pie at the party, and she's dancing all the while, and says, she's, she's swinging from the chandelier. They should have called this one Pinkie Pie Goes Gaga. Alright, canonically, we now know that these are after the movie, since we have Reform Tempest show up in the first chapter. Fluttershy goes to the Sea Pony City and finds out that there's some sort of sand dragon lurking about. One of the royal guards goes missing looking for it, and now Fluttershy and a bunch of sea ponies have to see what's up. Rest is predictable, and I don't mean that like this is written lazily. I just knew exactly what was going to happen because it's My Little Pony. The creature is misunderstood, and, and Fluttershy teaches the sea ponies that you need to learn to talk your problems out and not use violence. I don't know. It Kinda reminds me of the episode Over a Barrel, minus the stereotypes. Honestly, I'm just here to see more of the sea ponies. This is of course in canon with the other books in this movie series, and I know that's probably how they're supposed to be read, prequel, movie book, then all these, but I've seen the movie, I'm fine. It's canon in that they reference Tempest trying to steal the magic pearl in the prequel, and how the sea ponies have only been there for two moons. I liked all the little bits they explore in Sequestria, and seeing how the queen and all that stuff operates was kind of fun. This is what I appreciated about the series, seeing the actual characters from the movie again. Sorry, Sia. It's a book about Rainbow Dash and the bird pirates and daring do's in it. This is going to be the longest 135 pages I've ever read. Okay, in actuality, it was fine. Maybe I did just enjoy it for the references, but like most pirates, it had some sort of hook. Captain Saldana visits Rainbow Dash and her family and then finds out about this magic gem that the Pegasi used to have, which granted them good luck. They enlist the help of Daring Do to find it, as well as the old guy from the third Daring Do book. The birds secretly want to use the gem to bring them good luck, but Daring Do and friend want them to return at the cloud sale. Rainbow Dash finds out and they have some drama but it's not to the point where they're gonna betray the ponies so it's fine. The gem gets returned and there we are. I like this one the most and it's focus on the movie characters. The pirates were some of the more defined personalities they met. The daring do stuff I thought was really nice to come full circle with since in the order I'm reading all of these this is the last one. Not like it was enthralling but seeing book characters show up in other books is a weird thing for sure. I know the comics have recurring characters but those are the comics. Going into this video I assumed all these would be pretty one and done. Yeah, Rainbow's parents show up too in case you wanted more of them. And even Thorax and some of the reformed changelings have a cameo. So with that, I want to say we're through all the original stories. What's left is a lot of fan stuff. For fans, I mean. I'm not saying these weren't for fans, but once we get into the next segment, you'll understand. Official TV show guidebooks and character encyclopedias are a typical licensed product that a lot of popular shows have, but nobody really talks about. Yeah, there are a million Star Wars and Lego books, physical Pokédexes up the wazoo, but I'm talking about stuff like The Simpsons, A Complete Guide to Our Favorite Family, or The Big Book of Ninja Turtles. You have to have seen at least one of these for some show. If it's not a book based on the show's stories, then how about a book collecting info for fans? That's gotta get some people buying them. Adventure Time had one, Gravity Falls too, and and I'd like to make comparisons there to what we have with MLP. There are about five books that are made to look like real versions of things from the show. Not counting Daring Do, of course, or those two Equestria Girls books. You know that book that Twilight reads in the first episode? You can own it, and I did as a young child, and it was awesome. The Elements of Harmony is a time capsule of what I want to call the golden age of MLP. Not only the graphic design on the individual pages, which takes me back to that time, but all the little quirks and even things they didn't figure out yet. This is only 
a guide for the first three seasons, so characters that would be named later on don't have anything to describe them. Those bullies from the Sonic Rainboom episode have actual names, but here they're just called bullies. Bulk Biceps is Muscle Pony, and Bon Bon is Sweetie Drops. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. What I especially like about this one is that this is the only character guide here, outside of the art books of course, that features quotes and interviews with the show staff. I might have thought these were boring as a kid, but these were such a fun read now. From Lauren Faust's thoughts on the show and fandom, like how she wanted MLP to be good representation for girls, and to have things like the elements of harmony remain mysterious, to all the little tidbits from different members of the show staff about the creative process. Did you know that the Cutie Pox was going to have a rap song sung by Sweetie Belle and Scootaloo during the A Treat from Sugar Cube Corner Will Cheer You Up bit? The one thing that would have made this perfect for me would have been staff commentaries on each individual episode summary. But you know, what can you do? If you're a hardcore MLP collector or a fan, this is for sure something you should look into. The Elements of Harmony Volume 2 though? Oh, look how they massacred my pony guidebook. Even the cover and the little plastic slip that comes with it is a downgrade. The old one wasn't amazing, but this one has that weirdo branding with the blue background and the white trim and this primordial soup of characters. Like, who is this meant to be appealing to? I get by this point you'd want to make the brand more gender neutral, but this is just uggo. Yeah, waging war on blue MLP mid-2010s branding, sound off in the comments. Nothing from the show staff in here, and it's just the same kind of thing with the episode summaries from seasons 4 through 6. They have additional character bios, but even the way the character guide part of it is organized is so weird. t rack Chrysalis, and the Daring Do baddies are in the same section as Surrey Polo Mare and the restaurant critic from Spice Up Your Life. What did Zesty Gourmand do to get in there? Also, why is Hasey Turnip Truck listed in the Apple Family section? I get he was in the reunion, but why is he listed above Big Mac? The rest of the book is again the same. Episode summaries, song lyrics, and a little scrapbook style thing at the end. This time with a quote from the best character, Claude the Puppeteer. MLP guides aren't over. If there are four of these, at least four main guides. The 2017 version compiles things from up until 2017. Presumably this was to go along with the movie and the marketing push for that. This one was a lot more visually interesting than the other two guides were. There's a lot more going on on each page, which I really like. And as you'd imagine, it's more thorough in some places. Elements Part 2 has more bios for minor characters, but this one has so many other little bits that make up for it. The one thing I don't like is how much old, old art they use of the characters, like 2010 art. Not even. Some of this is taken from the 2009 Pitch Bible. The most recent guide is pretty similar to the 2017 release, presented in a similar way, but overall it's a lot better. No individual episode guides, but there are overviews for each season. The movie, and the best gift ever and Rainbow Road Trip, looks at each main character and some other important lore figures. It's not as comprehensive as someone like me might want, but it's for kids. All the info in here is stuff that you could get from watching the show, and might I add, this is cheap too. It was bigger than what I was expecting, since the cover looks like some of the chapter book re-releases and I was expecting it to be the same size, but this is the kind of thing you'd find in the middle of Five Below. There is that $200 coffee table book, and maybe that's better, but I'd love a big print guidebook for MLP. Stuff from the series, Equestria Girls, comics, or even the books, who knows? Equestrian lore? Maybe a timeline? How about that? I know you think I'm being ridiculous thinking about something like that for My Little Pony, but if this was a Cybershell video talking about Sonic guidebooks, you'd all be nodding your heads in agreement. The biggest plus I want to give them is the choice of key art. This is from 2019, so it's from that era where these PNGs look like they have a little extra life put into them, though I know that most of these are just reused key art from the 2017 movie, like this spike or this twilight running towards the camera, like, you can't fool me with that. And that's all the, what I'm gonna call, non-fiction pony books for now. I will give a mention to the two art books, one for the series in general, and one for the movie. They're art books, so what do you want me to say? They're thorough, and there's probably a lot to dive into that could maybe be done in a future video, who knows? We're gonna end off on what I like to call lore books. These are a type of guidebook, I guess, but these are meant to be non-fiction in the world of MLP. There's more direct lore in here, and for people who want real life-size pony props, these are also great. Although I think the version of the Journal of Friendship they actually sold would have been bigger. Yeah, yeah, somebody got fired, whatever, comic book guy. But you know, when I say that, I don't just mean the dimensions of the book, but the contents itself. All this one really is, is the friendship lessons from season 4 written out in a corresponding font for each character. There are also other neat parts, like Pinkie Pie's weird rant she does, and a little comic drawn by Spike, but this is really just a prop. Also, I need to mention the font used for Pinkie Pie's entries reminds me way too much of G3.5. I would not be surprised if it's the same one, and they just use whatever fonts Hasbro had the rights to laying around. This is the journal that had everybody up in arms in that one episode? You know the one. 
Who is buying the Wonderbolt handbook? I didn't know this was a thing until way later. It's got all the Wonderbolt stuff, a lot of info from that one episode where Rainbow Dash has to learn Wonderbolt's history. There's a lot of mentions here about proper etiquette and how to give constructive criticism. I don't think Spitfire, the lead Wonderbolt, is following any of these in the show. I think that's some sort of moral lesson meant for kids who wind up reading this, but this was such an obscure release that I can only see them marketing this to bronies. There's also other guidebook stuff about each individual bolt. My favorite part was Rainbow Dash's notes and the commentary at the end of each little section. This is supposed to be her copy of the book after all. It was a neat touch. After giving this a good read and thinking about the Wonderbolts in the show for a while, I came to an epiphany. The Wonderbolts and the Wonderbolts episodes are representation for military bronies. Think about it. Bronies who serve or who have served aren't too rare. They make up a large enough part of the fandom for me to know about them. They're in the brony documentary. John Delancey wouldn't lie to me like that. The Wonderbolts operate like some sort of military with all that protocol, boot camps, compounds, the structure of their ranks, everything. And there are a few episodes that are kind of about about the relatability of it, like Wonderbolts Academy or Newbie Dash, even Testing Testing 123 has to speak to some part of that experience. The Journal of the Two Sisters is the epitome of extra pony history. This was another prop that was shown in an episode of season 4, where Twilight reads the passage from it out loud, and you can tell which passage that is when reading this because, oddly, the way it's written it sounds nothing like the rest of the book. The book is from the perspective of the two royal pony sisters, Celestia and Luna, about their reign. And there are a few little stories about early Equestria, which is as a My Little Pony nerd or whatever are kind of outdated knowing what we know now, like how the zebras live just beyond the Everfree Forest and all speak in rhyme. Yeah, buddy, sure. And the weirdest thing I got from this book is how they reference characters who were part of the Heart Swarming Eve mythos. I always assumed that the sisters, as well as Star Swirl, came around a long way after those guys were gone, but I guess not. These two are like the only princesses Equestria's ever had, apparently. Maybe I'm just having all my ideas about Pony Lore Challenge while reading these. I don't know. I think it might be me. Speaking of princesses, we get a new character, Princess Platinum, who shows up. She's hard on the sisters until Luna plays a trick on her with the castle booby traps, and she learns to lighten up. One other bit I noticed was when they mentioned how Raising the Sun used to take six ponies, when in the season 9 episode Horseplay, that's part of the reenactment. So some of this they did pay attention to. This is probably one of the first pieces of media that has Star Swirl as Celestia and Luna's magic teacher. You know, thanks for that, Megan McCarthy. I would consider the Journal of the Two Sisters a time capsule in the same way that the Elements of Harmony was. You know, this was 2014 when MLP was still kind of big, and they were just starting to try and have a story. I don't think they were entirely successful, but that's up to your personal opinion. This was when I was watching the show as a kid, and I know that means that I have a bias, but I just thought it was neat. And that's all the My Little Pony books, at least the ones worth reading for this. And even then, I think I went a little further down the rabbit hole than I like. I appreciate that they do have pony books for kids to get into reading, but as I said in the intro, they have that for tons of franchises. There were some fun stories that I could see like die hard, die hard pony fans liking. Don't read upwards of five of them per day for a week like I did. I think that's the big takeaway from this. There are probably fan fictions with more depth and interesting concepts, and at least I'd be able to find audiobooks or adaptations of those. Oh, you know those are out there. Doing this wasn't a bad experience. There were little gold nuggets tucked in there. Number one thing was that some of these were shorter, more intimate stories, which I really liked with these characters. It, it was fun seeing more of the world and how they connected these to other pieces of pony media. Biggest recommendations are the Discord and Rarity ones, maybe the first Pinkie Pie one in her movie tie-in book. That first guidebook is a good read for the show stuff, and Ponyville Mysteries is a good oddity. The first two Equestria Girls books bridge the movies together, so if you like that, you can read those. The rest, go at your own risk. And as always, I want to give a shout out to all my people. Continue to support me on Patreon. Jackson, Byron Ritchie, One Bridgie Boo, HBM, Scambuli, As Safrani, Hoodie, The Fox's Raven, Nana, Kaylee Lahoda, Rosa, Shadewalker, Knife Girl, Technicolor, Jack Ketchman, Trixie Best, No Yak Best, Olive, SR Nano, Gator Kitty, Cascadia Arc, Bad Bessie, Damian, and Marshmallow. I can't think of a better outro, so until next time, goodbye.